Okay, hello, and uh, welcome to IBM Research. As you know, my name is James Kozlowski, and I'm going to speak to you about, right now, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, brain mapping, and specifically how we go about brain mapping within what's called the Computational Biology Center here at IBM Research. Now, computational biology sits at the boundary between life sciences and information technology. And the team that I'm on within computational biology, uh, known as computational and applied neuroscience, sits within computational biology, but at the boundary between neuroscience and computing. And our job within computational and applied neuroscience is to discover and develop new ways to map the brain. Because IBM, much like the rest of the world, who is investing very heavily in this area, urgently wants to know what the brain does and how it does it. So how does one go about mapping a brain? Uh, first of all, a map of the brain needs to include a map of what the brain computes specifically. And we've been working on that for about a decade, and I'm going to share some of the results with you. In addition, a map of the brain needs to include a map of the brain's components and their connectivity. And we've also been working on that for a decade. We've created methods for generating really enormous maps of artificial brain components based on the structure and network data from real brains. Now, with the dawn of connectomics, does anyone know what connectomics is? It's a new science that's trying to determine every connection between every neuron, every component in the brain. With this new science, we soon will have access to huge amounts of data to drive these types of simulations and this work. So the simple answers to both of these mapping problems are really not surprising or controversial. First, what the brain computes. The brain computes everything. That's right. Everything we perceive, everything we experience, every amazing behavior we observe in each other, in animals or ourselves, all is computed by the brain. Even things we know are computed elsewhere or play out in a different part of the universe. For example, the display on our iPhones or perhaps the atmosphere of a distant planet like Jupiter. All of these ultimately are accessed by us through local computations of our brains. Okay, so the brain computes everything. But what is it used to compute it with? Well, that's easy. These are the components. We have neurons, we have microcircuits, brain nuclei, and whole brain systems. So we know what the brain computes, and we know what it computes, computes it with, so we're done, right? Agreed? Okay, so thank you very much. I'm glad I had this chance to talk to you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay here at IBM Research, and goodbye, right? No, 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 don't, don't applaud, don't applaud. Let's back up. There's something wrong here, right? Even though we know what the brain computes and we know what it computes it with, the brain actually, uh, we need to know how it computes it. Until recently, we as neuroscientists could only view the brain's behavior and the operations that play out over it through small keyholes of our data collection methods. And today, that's all changed. And I'm going to give you some examples of how it's changed in a moment. Also, the components of the brain, while pretty cool looking, actually constitute a set of neural tissues. You know, it's the meat that thinks. And these are all examples of those components within those tissues. We have neurons from the spinal cord, microcircuits from the neocortex, a brainstem nucleus known as the inferior olive, and a larger brain system that includes this structure known as the olivocerebellar system. But I've played a trick on you. In fact, these images that you see are derived from simulations of these structures that we've generated within our team using IBM's Neural Tissue Simulator, a piece of software that we developed and that runs on a BlueGene supercomputer. So we at IBM know how to build the components of neural tissue, such as these, and we also know how to bring them to life using our Neural Tissue Simulator, right? It's alive! But what do, uh, what do we need to do to engender full-blown brain computations? This requires something more, something that we are only now beginning. And that's why I said hold the applause, because we're not done. I hope each of you can consider contributing in your careers as scientists and engineers to this, this new beginning, which is really a third map. The mapping from whole brain computation onto the components of the brain. The mapping from the brain as software to the brain as hardware. I've waited for this moment in neuroscience for really two decades. 
Today, I see this unprecedented variety of new methods, each aimed at generating data, enormous amounts of data, aimed specifically at performing this third type of mapping, taking us from the brain and its computation to the components of the brain. And this is done by recording and mapping all of the activity from all of the brain's components, specifically and simultaneously. And this explosion in methods is actually what's driving the Obama administration's recently announced brain mapping project. You may have heard about it, seen it in the Charlie Rose Show on television, or read about it, for example, in the Wall Street Journal, but it's also what's driving our work here today. Why has making this mapping been so difficult? Why only now, after a century of neuroscience, is it becoming possible? Well, let me describe what it's been like to be a neuroscientist up until this time. When you became a neuroscientist when I was joining the field, you chose a page from a brain atlas, built your career around that structure, and therefore tore the page out of the atlas and threw away the rest of the atlas. Okay? Today, that's different. You rising neuroscientists out there this morning, you will be able to study the brain as a whole system, intact, tightly coupled, integrated, as it is, all the way down to the level of these details shown here, and that's remarkable. And I'm going to show you how you're going to do it. We've all heard about reverse engineering, right? The flying saucer from New Mexico, whoop, 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 right? Well, no, but the reverse engineering really does take place. For example, when nations, companies, manufacturers want to know how the other guy did it, they put together a team to reverse engineer it. Now, what our team is doing is we're aiming to reverse engineer the computation of the brain and then map it to the brain's components, shown here, in that order. Why does the order matter? Well, imagine, for example, that we were from a place where there were no brick buildings. Okay, this is an analogy I'm going to give you. Let's say we wanted to imitate a construction technique that we'd heard about from this foreign country involving bricks. And let's say perhaps our spies had even smuggled out of that country a brick. What would we do? We could analyze the brick, measure its dimensions, weigh it, crack it open, determine its composition, right? How about plot in three dimensions, every single pebble, every grain of sand, every variation of color within the brick? Is that a good idea? Well, no. No, it's not. And we know it's not because we know what bricks are. But let's imagine for a moment we didn't know what bricks were, and that all we could do was collect these data, replicate them, and then distribute, and then distribute or make from them our own reverse engineered bricks. We might even create great big piles of reverse engineered bricks and try to live in them. But that's not a good idea either, right? Who wants to live in a pile of bricks? So eventually, I think we would learn that these measurements don't matter so much that we might have even guessed it up front if our spies had brought back pictures of these buildings and perhaps their plans. And we would then realize that brick bricks actually perform specific functions within the buildings based on their relationships to one another and that these functions must meet certain requirements in order to create useful buildings. In fact, the whole endeavor might benefit from first reverse engineering the building and its dynamics, and then reverse engineering the brick. And none of this is controversial. I think equally not controversial is that computer science and the IT industry, and even my own field of neuroscience for a long time, has been like the country with just the smuggled brick and lots and lots of stories about the amazing things you could do with bricks. These are the bricks, and the stories are what we observe each other doing, what we observe animals doing, and what we observe ourselves doing using these bricks. But these structures can't fully constrain the computations of the brain any more than a single brick can constrain the architectural designs of this building. Instead, what we need is something bigger, the third map. And that's what I mentioned earlier, a way to observe the brain in action, performing all the functions that we actually care about at the level of these components. We need a computational architecture of the brain. Now, we've started this work of reverse engineering the brain's computational architecture, its dynamics, at a scale much larger than what's shown in these small components using fMRI analysis. And we started with the brain at rest, simply doing what it does with little or no input. This idle state of the brain that you're seeing here emerged from the analysis of an fMRI data set and was pioneered in our group by Guillermo Secchi. What Guillermo did was he drove the analysis with a simple mathematical question. Which parts of the brain are best at explaining other parts? And the one that was best is shown by the green crosshairs. So starting from this mo most predictive location in the brain, what you're seeing is a matrix that plays out across the structures of the brain as a set of highlights. 
And these highlights are precisely what others had seen before using simpler techniques and called the resting state network. But not satisfied with just replicating a previous observation, Guillermo looked at another data set from a person tapping her fingers. The data revealed another structure in a sensory motor area, again marked by green crosshairs, that's highly predictive of everything else going on in the brain. And we as neuroscientists thought it made sense. The areas involve other motor areas as well as some areas involved in hearing. But what's interesting is that I didn't tell you something. Both of these matrices were actually created from the same experiment of the woman tapping her hands. And so what this means, in other words, is that the resting state network is embedded within the finger tapping network, and we can conclude that the brain is in fact a system whose operations can occur in parallel, much like those on a supercomputer. Now, fMRI has been helpful in understanding these brain procedures, but to look at the brain when it's doing something else, in this case, falling asleep under anesthesia, a finer level of recording was needed. This level of detail was provided by another technique known as ECHO-G, which in publicly available data from the Riken Brain Sciences Institute in Japan records electrical signals at a much greater temporal resolution than fMRI from the surface of the brain of, in this case, a monkey, as it goes under anesthesia. And what you can see is that the dynamics of the brain shift, extracted again as a set of matrices, and these matrices are shown here as a set of causal arrows that take us from several brain structures to several others. Now, during the portion of the brain, uh, during, during the portion of the, of the movie, which is the awake state, these arrows point in both directions, and many take us from the back of the brain to the front. But when you transition into anesthesia, and the anesthesia kicks in, you see that the arrows almost all point from the front to the back, and that the overall state of the brain goes from being unstable while you're awake to being highly stable, as revealed by analyses of these matrices when you're asleep. This is interesting. In fact, these analyses can potentially tell a doctor how deeply a patient is under anesthesia. And this is something I've heard is quite useful when you're in the operating room being operated on. So, finally, I'd like to tell you about our most recent efforts at mapping brain computation onto the components of the brain. What we're looking at now is a very small animal, one of the smallest vertebrates. Using a very special technique, we're looking all the way down to the smallest components I showed you earlier. This animal is a larval zebrafish. It's transparent, and so with its brain as big as a poppy seed, and it's transgenic, and so with nearly every neuron in its brain fluorescent, the zebrafish provides a nearly complete computational readout of the brain's computation. Whenever any neuron becomes active, it blinks. And amazingly, the zebrafish's brain, despite being so small, has all of the major systems that I showed you earlier, because it's a vertebrate, including those that were shown, as well as others that we have in our own brains. Now, these data are also publicly available and came from uh, a group at Howard Hughes's Genelia Farm Research Campus in Virginia. And the same team has these amazing plans to immerse the animal in a virtual reality environment where it can swim around, solve problems, avoid predators, all the while as they continue to image the activity of every single neuron in its brain. Now, we factored these brain data as one enormous matrix. And what, what I'm showing you here with the flanking animations is that this factoring, this most basic mathematical operation, uncovers brain systems, again, operating in parallel. And this is really interesting to us. We're pursuing this in order to understand, for example, this global brain flash, which you may have observed uh, in the movie during its loop. Um, in fact, we're calculating these, these factors and analyzing the data to try to understand this flash uh, using a blue gene supercomputer down the hall from us. So here we are. We have four beginnings of how to map brain function, dynamics, and computation on the brain structure, brain software onto brain hardware. We're aiming to find the basic computational architecture of the brain as a whole, and our ultimate goal is to regenerate these data in model systems based on the math and the knowledge we have about dynamical systems and neuroscience, just like the bricks in the building. After we're done, we'll immerse the model in different data environments, giving it different inputs, and ask the simple question, what would a real brain do in this new environment, given these new inputs? And I anticipate some interesting results and some predictions to come from these experiments, so I encourage you all to stay tuned. And so in closing, this to me is the ultimate goal of neuroscience in its golden age, to reduce the brain to a computational device. We will understand at that point 
how to transform not only neuroscience as a field, but perhaps the IT industry as a whole. And I encourage you all to participate in this transformation in your own careers. I think that it would be nice to come back here someday and discuss how neuroscience and uh, computing have no boundary between them. And ultimately, that neuroscience is information technology. So thank you.